right now, thousands of people are staring at me with high hopes that I can deliver an idea worth spreading. No pressure. My heart's racing, my palms are sweaty, and I keep thinking, why did I agree to do this? Now, we've all heard that most people's number one fear is public speaking, and number two is death. So as I'm sitting, I was thinking about this as I'm sitting at my great uncle's funeral with my family. And it occurs to me that people are more afraid of speaking at a funeral than of being the guest of honor. <laughs> Our fears are as real and as powerful as we allow them to be. See, the first time I can remember being truly afraid, I was about six years old. My older brother, had gotten special permission from our parents for us to go and play at a park that was a ways away from where we lived. Now this was a big deal because we had to cross a major highway and our parents didn't usually let us play that far away. So when we get to the park, we decide to have a competition. We're gonna see who can fly the furthest off of the swing set. Spoiler alert, I won. <laughs> but how I won was by jumping so far off of that swing set that I landed on a manhole cover and broke all the bones in my left arm. Needless to say, I was the last person to jump that day. And as I brushed myself off and got up, I looked at my arm and the bones were nearly poking out of the skin. And in that moment, all I wanted was my mom. And that's when he told me. See, my brother hadn't really gotten permission for us to be at that park which meant that I had to go home and explain to my mom how I hurt myself someplace that I shouldn't have been playing. Now that's real fear. <laughs> so we get home. I remember walking up the stairs to my parents' bedroom and my mother is sitting on the edge of the bed doing her hair. I walk in with my arm behind my back as best as I could and I say, if I show you something, do you promise you won't get mad? <laughs> so she nods and I removed my mangled left arm. And my mother let out a scream that is unlike anything I'd ever heard before or since. She rushes me to the emergency room. I get bandaged up, a cast on my arm, and eventually things get better. But as I reflected on that moment, I had a realization. When I was in my mother's room, my arm didn't hurt. You see, in that moment, I was more afraid than I was in pain. And that was my first lesson about fear. If we allow it, it can be incredibly powerful over us physically and mentally. So fast forward to 2009. I met this wonderful woman in law school and we had been dating for about two years. I decided that I wanted to, her to be my wife. So in a way for me to earn some favor with her parents, I decided on a Saturday I would help her and her mom go shopping. After a few hours of hold this, hold that, uh, how does this look, people ignoring my opinion, we eventually <laughs> get to the point where we're going back to Tiffany's house. And so um, after, while Tiffany and her mother are parking the car, I run in the house to use the restroom. And the moment I come through the door, her father is standing there with a look on his face that says, explain yourself. And so without thinking, I blurt out, Jean and Tiffany are coming, they're just parking the car and dashing to the restroom. As I'm washing my hands, it occurs to me. I just did the unthinkable. I called my girlfriend's mother by her first name to her husband. To make matters worse, this was the day I was going to ask for his permission to propose. So after washing my hands for an awkwardly long time, I decided to step out of that restroom and take a risk. Maybe he hadn't heard. So I step outside and then I come to the realization that I'm not that lucky. What you need to know about Tiffany's father is that we have a lot in common. We're members of the same fraternity. We actually have the same birthday and we have the same appreciation for sarcasm. So as I walk out of that bathroom, he's already begun referring to his wife as Mrs. Redding. <laughs> and for the next 30 minutes, he continues to refer to his wife as Mrs. Redding. Message received. 
So I then, after about 30 minutes of this, ask him, can I talk to you in private? He says, of course, and walks me down the stairs to their dark basement. <laughs> <laughs> I find the light and begin to apologize profusely. I've never done that before. I'll never do it again. Indeed, to this day, they are in my phone as Mr. and Mrs. Reddit. <laughs> and after a few minutes of apologizing, I can see that he's starting to soften up. So I decide to take my shot. I say, since I have you down here, there is one other thing I'd like to ask. And so I ask him for his blessing in proposing. Longest pause ever. <laughs> and then he kind of tilts his head and smiles and says, of course. And that was my second lesson in fear. That in order for you to beat your fears, you have to face them. But by facing them, you've actually already won. So fast forward to 2013, I began my MBA at Darton, the University of Virginia. My first year goes as expected. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of difficult times and a lot of learning. By the second year, I am the president of the Black Business Student Forum. And we are beginning our year with the death of Mike Brown. On August 9th, 2014, Mike Brown was killed by a Ferguson police officer. And I'm the president of the Black Business Student Forum at Darden. So to give you some context, in my graduating class, there are about 316 people. Of those, 11 are black. Two are international, and only two are women. So by my second semester, things are starting to heat up, and conversations are starting to happen. But by, January, by February, we have two major events to do. There's Black History Month speech, and we have a black business student conference. So for Black History Month, realizing that what the kind of tone and temper was of the, the school, I decided that we're going to have a die-in. And what that meant was, while I was giving my speech on Black History Month, I read the names of each of the 14 African Americans who had been unarmed and killed by the police in the last year. And that every, for every one of those names I read, one of my classmates' bodies hit the ground. It was emotional. It was impactful but it wasn't enough. See, over the time that I had become a student leader at Darden, people had shared their stories with me. And while that event was impactful, it didn't really change the environment. So then we get to the conference. And when we're doing the Black Business Student Conference, I decide that we're going to take this opportunity to eradicate a myth, that it's too hard to find top talent and black talent at Darden, and they won't come to Charlottesville. So what we do is, my team and I found historically black colleges across the mid-Atlantic and invited them all to come to our global business conference. That day, we were able to create an environment where 150 black students from across the mid-Atlantic were able to participate in what the dean called the best conference he had ever seen put on by a student organization. But we still weren't there yet. See, we had never had, as a community, had the talk. And we needed to have the talk. So I'd organized and planned to have a talk with our student leaders, our dean, and our faculty. By the time we get to actually have the event, I've gotten feedback from black and white students saying, I don't know if this is a good idea. People aren't really comfortable. And no one's going to come. The day comes where we're supposed to have the talk. I get a call from the student services. They say, something's wrong. So I immediately rush over. And when I get there, I'm told, we don't have enough seats. What do you mean? Well, there's 250 people who want to participate in this, but the room only holds 120. So we need to have an overflow room. What I learned was, and what I got confirmation on, was that it wasn't just the black kids who needed to talk. We all had to be a part of this. So we had the talk. We started this talk as most conversations on race do, very surface. And when we started this talk, it was all about things we can all generally agree on. Racism is bad. Yeah, we get that. I wish that these things didn't happen. OK, thanks. But as the time went on, I could look and see the frustration and anxiety and exhaustion from the faces of my black classmates 
not again, not another one. We're not just going to glance over this and make everyone feel better. And then it happened. One of my classmates decided to tell his story. See, he told the story about how every day after he left school, he checked every light on his car because it was dark and he was scared as a six foot three black man of being pulled over for a bad blinker. And by him telling his story, he gave us permission to tell our stories. And so I told my story about what it felt like to be a black man and a leader in a town where when I moved here, my mother cried. And that was my third lesson about fear. You see, what Marcus Thomas taught me was that courage in facing your fears requires vulnerability. His willingness to share his story and take the risk of being ostracized, doubted, made fun of, and treated differently enabled the rest of us to tell our stories. Now, everything didn't change that day, but our community began to talk, and our community began to heal, which is something that I think Charlottesville needs right now. So those are my three lessons on fear. Number one, it can be incredibly powerful if you allow it to be. Number two, you, the only way to overcome it is to face it. And when you face it, you've already won. And number three, when you decide to face your fears, you have to be vulnerable. Lastly, no matter what fears we're facing, I'd ask that each of us remember that whatever you're in front of, including death, it's not nearly as scary as standing in front of thousands of people <laughs> with high hopes that you'll share an idea worth spreading. No pressure.